while it is big, but not close to the Hayman fire that scorched nearly 140,000 acres of national forest land northwest of Colorado Springs. Nine years later, the recovery efforts continue. News First 5's Bill Folsom with more from the burn area. Moving quick today, yet planting in the Hayman burn area has been going on for nine years. We only plant for between two to three weeks every year. Um, after that, it's so dry that this ground compacts and you, you can't even get a shovel into this thing. These tend to be easier to get into the ground, especially where planting uh, spots are limited uh, due to rocks. One plug at a time, 134 per acre. This year, they're shooting for more than 1,000 acres. That's 140,000 or so tiny trees. A labor supported by partners who raise and donate money to fund tree planting projects. It's a community coming together to, to fix a problem that we have. Nearly 140,000 acres burned when conditions were dry and wind pushed a small flame out of control. Positive work that big picture is because of a devastating situation nine years ago when fire conditions we're much like they are right now in our area. Trees from previous plantings are taking hold. These went in five years ago. It doesn't take much to, to get something uh, of this magnitude in these kind of conditions. Typically it takes 75, 75 years for a ponderosa pine tree to get to maturity to the point where it's actually going to produce seed. Positive progress is happening at the Hayman burn area. But it's going to be, you're looking at three to 400 years probably before we see you know, this whole area covered. It takes more than a lifetime to bring back what an out-of-control fire can take out in just weeks. Bill Folsom, News First 5. Nine years later, nine years later, 140,000 acres caused by one person. The gentleman said it's going to take 300 years to fix something in one moment. What could be so devastating? What could do that kind of damage in that short amount of a time? Today we're going to talk about our tongue, our mouth, a mouth that was created to save many lives. God never intended for our mouth to be so destructive let us pray heavenly father we thank you for this day we thank you for your word god you the psalmist said for your glory we would do anything god and that's what we're here we're here not just singing those words but we're here to create a lifestyle that our lifestyle resembles and reflects someone that would do anything for you so that you may be glorified here on earth, God. Your desire was to bring us here to demonstrate heaven on earth. Allow us to be your vessels, God, for your glory. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this assignment. This is all about you, and it has nothing to do with me, God. We celebrate you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about this tongue. We're going to really talk about this tongue. That is my assignment today. I want us to talk about it. And even, Pastor, I thank you so much for the, the message that you taught last week on sowing. And this, your message literally ties into what we're going to talk about today. Because there was something that was sown in this clip that I played that had a harvest nine years later. And all of the sowing pastors you taught us last week that we do may not necessarily be good. Your wife's not the only one that appreciates the harvest. The pastor taught a beautiful message last week entitled Next Level Harvest. My wife also, my beautiful wife. Hey, babe. Hey, how you doing? Looking good? I thank God for my beautiful wife. My wife also loves this time of the year and we can uh, it, it celebrate the harvest and the pumpkins. And we have the pumpkin bread. And my wife is, likes to go up north and go to the apple orchards and pick apples. And she comes back. She makes apple uh, uh, pies. And we have apple bread because this is the season where she goes and picks apples. But those apples that you picked, Pastor reminded us last week, those apples were planted as apples. There's no way that an apple that is planted as an apple can ever be an orange. 
because you taught us, Pastor, about sowing, and Pastor gave us the definition to say it's when we scatter or plant. To have a future in mind of a harvest. When we plant, when we scatter those seeds, we have a desire then that there's going to be a benefit, a benefactor in the future. So essentially, we plant something now for tomorrow. That is the, 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 the concept and principle of seed time harvest where we plant today for something tomorrow we plant for a harvest we plant to reap to profit we plant something because we want to profit you all know I do wealth management I teach about how to make an investment profitable and every time I sit with the client I say this I said it's not about timing the market it's about how much time we spend in the market I let my clients know up front that I can't make you rich overnight this seed that we're going to plant today pastor it's going to take some time before we get a harvest and that's what we have to understand about when we're planting when we're sowing that it takes time there's this period to where we have to continue to water and we protect what we planted and that goes against society because right now in 2023, we're in a society that teaches us that we must have it now. We must have our things now. Log onto Instagram right now. Everything you see, they're going to try to present it to you within a minute and 30 seconds. They're cramming messages. They're cramming everything into a minute and 30 seconds because we're teaching society that we must get the results right now. If I want to impart something into you, I got to give it to you right now or I don't have any success of you having it. And that's the exact opposite of what we talk about when we're talking about planting something today for something that we want to have a harvest on tomorrow. We plant apples today. We expect apples tomorrow. We don't plant apples today and expect oranges tomorrow. We plant blessings today. We expect blessings tomorrow. If we plant discourse today, if we plant confusion today, we don't expect blessings tomorrow. If we plant chaos today, we're going to get chaos tomorrow. My pastor taught me in Psalm 78 and 4 that we will not, this is a scripture you read, Pastor, says we will not hide them from their children. That's what you read last week to say we are not going to hide this gospel. We're not going to hide this good news from my children and my children's children. If we want this good news to continue to spread that Jesus saves, that he lives, that he reigns inside of me, I've got to do what the scripture says. I've got to tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord. And his strength and his wonderful works for what he's done. It says, I've got to tell, I've got to tell, I've got to tell, I've got to use my mouth. Are you all catching that? That's what you taught us last week. Half of the gospel is about what we're going to use with our mouth. He wants to see how we're walking. He wants to see how we're talking. I will tell. If we don't tell it, they won't know it. So we're going to talk about this small little member today, our tongue. Our assignment today is in James chapter 3. I want to read verses 1 through 12. Thank your online audience that are with us. Please turn into your Bibles. We celebrate you today. God is good here. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. I'll be reading in the New King James Version. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bit in horses, mouths that may obey us, and we turn the whole body. Look also at ships, the author says. Although they are so large and driven by fierce words, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire. That's why I showed you that clip before I came up here. A world of iniquity. The tongue is set 
among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell for every kind of beast and bird or reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Not this tongue. Every beast in the field has been tamed by mankind, but not the tongue. The scripture says no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. It should not be this way. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Can't sow apples and get bananas. It's not possible. We say amen for the reading of his word. We're going to really dissect this smallest member in our body, the tongue. The scripture says, for life and death are in the power of the tongue. Today we're going to talk about next level power. How do we get power? James understands the importance of us managing this powerful agent that we call our tongues. And before we get into the scripture and dissect what he said in this letter, I want us to just take a moment and look at from a biological standpoint. I like to study things when I'm studying the word because there's always correlation. So let's look at some tongue fun facts. Natural tongue fun facts. The first one, just wanna, I just want to enlighten you for just a moment, so bear with me. The first thing I notice about the tongue as I study Biologically, the tongue is the most flexible muscle in the body. It is one of the strongest and the most flexible. It doesn't need skeletal support. It's also, also a little spiritual undertone in there. Because of its flexibility, it can manipulate food in our mouth and aid in cleansing food particles to prevent all disorders. This tongue of ours is our most flexible member in our body. It doesn't need skeletal support. It's flexible. It can go either way. It can go to the left. It can go to the right. Based on the content, the tongue can be used for good, and it's flexible enough to be used for evil. It can be used for good. It can be manipulated because it's so flexible, depending on the operator, it's just flexible. There's no skeletal support. It can be used for good. In one sentence on Sunday morning in church service, when we're praising God and we're standing up and we're saying God is good and for my glory, it can be used for good. And then later on that day when somebody cuts us off in traffic, it can be manipulated and it can be used for evil because it's flexible. Fun fact. These are just fun facts. These are just... Do, do with them what you like. The tongue is one of the most active body parts. See, our bodies and engines need to shut down at night. And there are certain parts of our body that have to keep form. But essentially, sleep is necessary so that our engines can just shut down. But the tongue is so active that even while we're sleeping, it's pushing saliva to the throat. Because we have to keep our throat salivated. So while you're sleeping... And in La La Land, your tongue is still working. As a matter of fact, today, your tongue alone is going to, if you're a man, use about 2,000 words. And if you're a woman, your tongue today alone is going to probably use about 3,000 words. If you're a woman, women have more to say than us men. Dwayne said his wife uses about 3,750. But our tongues are so active. It's probably the most active thing we're going to do today. I used the restroom this morning. Maybe I'll use it again today. Maybe I'll use the restroom twice today. Maybe I'll use my hands 50 times while I'm up here talking. But this tongue of mine is going to get the most play today. This tongue is the most active thing in my life today. It's the most active part of my body. It has most influence of, of what I'm going to do today. It's going to mostly happen with this tongue. 
Here's another one. Tongue has multiple features. We use it for tasting, chewing, grinding. Look at all these multiple features. Drinking, or swallowing, or speaking, or defending. It defends uh, our tonsil. The tongue defends our tonsil from getting bacteria. It just protects us. It's got all these different functions. This tongue has multiple functions. It can be used for good. It can be used for evil. It can be used for a lot of things. But it's so flexible that it's going to be based on the operator as to how we use it. But this tongue, according to our facts today, has multiple functions. Those are our fun facts that I wanted to just just lay on you today before we get into this word. And I also want to remind us about something that Pastor Bell said last week in the form of his burning question. So, Pastor Bell, this was your burning question today. I was taking notes last week. Pastor Bell asked us the question, does my walk prove that I am existing with the end in mind? Does my walk prove? Does the way I live, the way I respond, does it prove when I'm sowing, do I realize what I'm sowing today in my walk? Do I have the end in mind and what God has prepared for me, for what he purposed and created me here on earth? When I get up today, am I thinking about the end? Does my walk prove that I have the end in mind? That was what you asked us last week, right? So here's my burning question today. Does my talk Prove I am existing with the end in mind. Is my tongue, is my tongue planting seeds for the future? Is my tongue, is my seeds that will benefit me? Am I planting seeds with my mouth today that are going to benefit me in the future? Am I planting seeds within my wife that's going to benefit her in the future? Am I planting seeds with my mouth regarding my children for something that will benefit them in the future? Am I planting seeds for my church with my mouth for something that's going to benefit us in the future? Am I planting seeds with my mouth for this community for something that will benefit us in the future? That's what we're going to talk about today. So when we turn into James, we're in the third chapter. And remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked from James 1 for you all that were here. We talked about patience. Patience is the ingredient for seed time harvest. You have to be patient. What did we say patience was? The Bible says let patience have her work or let patience have its work. In other words, we're going to submit ourselves to God, allowing him to be in full care. Our submission to God And trusting him for my life is what patience is. It's not just waiting. It's not just patience. It's not just sitting there waiting. It's me being able to submit my calls to God and let him completely be in control. And that's what we learned in James 1 was the trials. The test that God gives us to grow us closer to him requires that we, in the process, become closer to him to where we're fully submitted to his way, not my way. That's what patience is. We learned that in James 1. It was about patience and the testing and trials. Then when you flip over to James 2 is when he says, be ye doers. He was talking about the walk that pastor was talking about last week. We got our our actions must match our confessions to Christ. If I say I believe in Christ, if I've accepted Christ into my life, then my life should be a reflection of that. Be ye doers of the word. It's our faith in action. And then by the time we flip over here to James chapter 3, he's now talking about our words in action. Remember we said James was a practical teacher, the half-brother of Jesus? He didn't necessarily walk with him while he was on earth, but he, in the day of Pentecost, became a believer. And he began to put together practical teachings for the church in Jerusalem so that they could live a successful life as believers. So he talked about our walk first, and by the time you get to chapter 3, he's now talking about our talk. And how do we manage this tongue? So let's do it. I got three natural fun facts. I've got three spiritual fun facts that I found. We're going to get to those in a moment. But we have to understand the power of this tongue. Because many of you, including myself, we're sitting here as the benefactors of things that were said to us 5, 10, 15 
20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we're sitting here still responding and reacting to things that were said to us years ago. The words that were spoken, whether it was through our parents or through a, a, a teacher, someone that we knew that had influence, there were things that were said to us years ago. Whether they were good or bad, that are still impacting our lives I thank God for my parents because when I was five years old, they said, you're going to read this word. You're going to learn this word because someday you're going to teach this word and you're going to lead other people to Christ and you're going to lead people through the nations. Forty-five years ago, my parents told me through their words that I was going to do exactly what I'm doing today. My mother and father told me that I was going to teach the word and here I am. I want you to know, One Church ATL, that words matter. Marriages have been impacted by words. There are marriages that are dying or have died because of something someone said. They released something in the atmosphere with this powerful agent, and it completely changed the relationship. This tongue is powerful, and James taught us, my first fun fact is that James taught us first thing he said in the Scripture, and I just want to paraphrase what he was saying, but he's saying to us, My first biblical fun fact is that the tongue is small, but yet powerful. This tongue is small, but yet powerful. I love the way James shows us the disproportionate size of the tongue in relation to the body. And oh, don't forget that first part of that chapter where he's talked about the teacher. If you're going to speak, you're going to have the responsibility of teaching or talking to a group of people with your mouth understand the great responsibility because I'm standing here as a member but the body the church body is being directed by what I say so if I get it right James is saying that's great because I have the ability to influence many and what I say to you if you receive it and go out and say it to others this gospel could potentially spread like wildfire Remember the clip, the the fire spread like wildfire at 140,000 acres? So the responsibility I have to teach the right thing today is great because there are 60 or 70 people here today that have the opportunity to do what I do. So if I say the right thing, if I teach it the right way, it could spread like wildfire. And James has said we need to get that right. When we're teaching the Word of God, we need to teach it in context. The responsibility when you represent God or when you represent yourself, that you represent the truth. Because there's someone that's listening to it because those words have power and those words have the ability to direct. And that's what James wanted us to understand in this passage. He's saying the tongue is small but yet powerful. He compares it to a horse. How many of us have ever ridden a horse in here? I didn't expect that many people to raise their hands. That's good. So you'll understand his analogy. Have you ever seen the strength of a horse? Have you ever looked at the, you know, we use the word stallion. These horses are strong. They're big. They're powerful. I grew up in the country riding horses. My aunt's uh, boyfriend had a horse, and he used to always say to me, Rod, don't stand behind the horse. You all understand that, that have ridden a horse? Don't ever stand behind a horse. As much as I love that horse and that horse loved me, when you get behind the horse, it just has an, uh, an instinct just to kick. And that kick is strong enough if it hits you in the wrong place to kill you. Why? Because this horse is strong, it's mighty, it's big. But when you stick a small bit in the horse's mouth, James is saying now you have the ability to steer that horse. You now have the ability to guide that horse. And that horse will go because of its flexibility, that horse will go wherever you want it to go. You could even steer that horse into the, to its death off the cliff. And then James uses the analogy of the ship. Same with the ship. Have you ever been on a ship? My wife and I were on a ship. There were 2,000 people. This ship was majestic. But it was steered and guided by this small rudder. This small little rudder, this small little member had control of this huge body. And all these people on this ship was responsible for this little small rudder steering that ship in the right direction. So James wants us to understand the power of this small agent to steer our body. This agent has the ability to steer our lives. 
And he makes it clear in my next slide because my next slide says that the tongue can either edify or destroy. This is just a side point to the tongue being powerful. The tongue can either edify or the tongue can destroy. And you're not my destroy people. I don't every time I walk over here to say something negative, I'm not pointing that at you. So let me let me switch it. The tongue can either edify or the tongue can destroy. But let's look at the scripture about the design and the intent that God had for the tongue. My scripture for that is found in Ephesians 4.29, just to back up what James is really helping us to understand about the tongue. This is, was the original design of the tongue. Let no corrupt word proceed out of our mouth or your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it might impart grace to the hearers. This tongue can either edify or destroy. But the word tells us what God wants us to do with our tongue. The tongue was never created for us to destroy. The tongue was created for us to edify. And that's what the scripture says. It, and so this ship is being directed into the place it either needs to go or a place that it shouldn't go by this small rudder. This tongue has the ability to bless. A couple things that God wants us to do with our tongues. He wants us to exalt God. God, I love you. God, you're merciful. God, I thank you. And that's all I was doing today. I just, I wasn't, I was good. God was just so great. And I'm glad to be at a church where I can get deliverance and be, feel the presence of God. That's all that I was happening to me. I was just using my tongue to exalt God today. And that's what it was created for, was to exalt him. But the other thing that God created my tongue for was also to edify one another. That is the direction that God wanted me to steer my tongue. My tongue was designed to exalt God and to edify others. Not all the other stuff. My tongue was not created to create chaos. My tongue was not created to create division. My tongue was not created to gossip. My tongue was not created to get involved in conversations that I have no business being in. God said I didn't create the tongue for that. The tongue was created for edification, and that's the way he wants us to use it. So my question to you all is, does this powerful agent of mine, this is a question to you all, I'm asking myself this, does this powerful agent that I have, does it edify and bless? You can ask yourself that question. Do I use my tongue only for edification, exalting God, and blessing others. That is why my tongue was created. If I'm doing anything else contrary to that, for every of my 3,000 words if I'm a woman or 2,000 words if I'm a man today, does, does every one of those words fall under the category of exaltation and edification? Can I answer that question? That's what my tongue was created for. So watch this. Here's the next slide I have related to the tongue being powerful. Our tongue needs to bless and edify. We're all in agreement for that, right? That our tongue should be used for edification, exaltation, and blessing. But it only should be, uh, we should only edify what we believe, not what we see. My tongue should be used to edify what I believe, not what I see. My tongue was created to edify based on my belief system. In our men's retreat last week, the brothers, we talked about what do we believe. God wants us to believe in him, so what we say and what we do comes out of our belief system. Not what we think. Not what we see. So the next scripture I want to put on the screen is Joel chapter 3, verse number 10. I don't want to read the entire scripture, but at the end of it, it says, let the weak do what? Say, I am strong. This powerful agent should be used to speak life into my situation and the, situ and the lives of others. Let the weak say, I am strong. I'm not speaking on what I see. I'm not in denial about my situation. I'm not in denial about the fact that I'm in a valley. I'm not denial, in fact, that maybe my body's weak. 
I'm not in denial that, that maybe perhaps there's a deficit in my life. But in that moment, I'm going to speak what I believe and not what I see. Let the weak say I'm strong. That's exactly what God did in Genesis chapter 1. God looked at the earth. The Bible says it was without form. It was dark. It was void. God stepped into that situation and he said, let that he spoke what he believed. God spoke spoke what he desired. God spoke what he preferred. He said, let there be light. That didn't mean he was not in denial, that he was in denial about the fact that it was dark, that it was chaotic, that there was a void. Doesn't mean we have to, do, to, to, to deny these places that we're in our life. We're going to be in the valley of the shadow of death. But we speak to what we believe. He spoke the word and he confronts it. Watch this, One Church ATL. God confronted the darkness with his word. Let there be light. He confronted the chaos in his world. He confronted that dark place. He confronted that dry place. And my question to us today, are we confronting that dark place in our life? Are we confronting that void? Are we confronting that weakness? I'll say this all the time, and I'm going to continue to say it. That which we will not confront, we will not change. We're not perfect. Everybody in here has issues. Are we confronting those things that are not true? Am I confronting those things in my life where there's a deficit? And my second question, and these are both rhetorical questions, if we are confronting those dark places are in our life, are we confronting them with the word? Are we using our words? Or are we using God's words? Because we know God's words work already, right? So why in my dark place would I use my own words and not use God's words? When Jesus was in the wilderness and he was confronted with darkness, he said, oh, I got this one figured out. I got the answers to these questions. It is written, Satan. He used the word. That's how we confront darkness. That's how we confront pain in our body. We don't deny that we're in pain, but we says, let, let, uh, uh, Isaiah 53 and 5, with his stripes, I am healed. Hell no, it doesn't mean we're not, that we're not in pain, that you didn't wake up this morning in pain, but you speak the word to that situation because we know the word works. James said this little agent is small, but yet powerful. It has the ability to direct. But here's something else I saw. My, my, next, my next point here is... James also knew that the tongue is humanly untamable. And that's something we have to come into grips with, one church ATL, that our tongue is humanly untamable. I don't care how accomplished you are. I don't care how much you practice from or practice restraint, how high your IQ is. The Word of God teaches us that this particular member is untamable. And it goes on to say that, you know, God gave us dominion. He gave us dominion over all these animals, the beasts of the field and the fowls. But this one little member is the only thing that he didn't give us power over, ourselves. He gave us power over the animals. He gave us power over his creation. But this one thing, the scripture reminds us that I can't do this one by Myself. Let me, let me refer back to the scripture. It says, even though the tongue is a little member and boasts great things, see how great a little fire kindles. Now, verse 6 says, and the tongue is a fire. That's why I put that little clip on the screen. A world of iniquity. The tongue is so set amongst our members that it defines a whole body. Set on fire the course of nature. And set on fire by hell. I'm about to come down some folks street. And I already know I'm coming down your street because the way you guys are looking at me right now. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. Tanya, you looking at me like, boy, 
you, if, if, if you don't have a poker face today, <laughs> but this is all our issue. This is my issue, my tongue. I say things sometimes, and I'm like, oh, my God. Am I the only one? Is that you too, Dion? You say, oh, oh, oops, I shouldn't have said that. There's times that God has given me words for people, and I've given them to them in the wrong season. Even though it was the truth, I've harmed people. Maybe if I just testify about me, that'll make you guys feel comfortable with your stuff. I've given people the word in the wrong season, and it's harmed them, because even though God gave me a an, 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 uh, revealed truth to me, it wasn't the season to say that. So even though we, we could have the truth, it may not be time to share the truth. Our tongue needs restraint. And he says that even though I gave you dominion over all of my creation, this one little tongue, you can't constrain it on your own. And he compared it to a wildfire. That's why I showed that today. Let me give you some fun facts about that fire. That fire was 35 miles north of Colorado. To this day, it happened in 2002. It is the largest wildfire ever known to the state of Colorado. Forty million dollars later, five firefighters dead, one civilian dead because one person, and she was a forestry technician, she made a decision to light a small fire that she thought was going to be small and going to be very harmful and not impactful to a lot of people. But this one fire spread, and she wanted to set this fire so that she could contain it and, and get the credit for it. But this fire, in a small amount of time, spread so far to nine years later on the clip, they were still trying to undo the damage that she did in one moment. And James is comparing our tongues to that, that we could say one thing to one person in the wrong season and the ground be fertile enough to where that thing could spread like wildfire. He wants us to understand how much damage we can do with this tongue. The scripture says the tongue is unconstrained. You know where I saw that definition of unconstrained? Uh-oh. Please forgive me. Don't, don't be. Don't, I gotta, it's just in my notes. The definition of unconstrained is found in the word gossip. Uh-oh. So let's look at when we, here, we need to know and have a litmus test for when we're gossiping. This is for all of us. And I'm just going to go to Webster's for this. I got a Webster's definition, and then I got an Ebonics definition. <laughs> and I think both of them will be helpful. But the Webster's definition of gossip is unconstrained conversation, typically involving details that have not been confirmed as the truth. So if I'm involving myself in a conversation and I don't really know what the truth is, guess what I'm doing? That was the Webster definition. Are we all clear? There's still a few people that didn't answer, so let me give you the Ebonics definition. And I heard another pastor say this, and I stole it from him, so, but it, it works. He says, talking about somebody with somebody when neither of them are part of the problem or the solution. That's probably better. That, we, can we connect with that one a little bit better? When I get with someone and talk about somebody with someone, and neither of us are part of the problem or the solution, guess what I'm doing? So if someone comes to me with information that has not been confirmed to be true, and I'm indulging in this conversation, and they or me are not part of the problem or the solution, guess what I'm doing? I gossiping. Right after that in the scripture, he says that man could be, that the, the beast of the field could be tamed, but this tongue cannot be contained or tamed by man. He says it's not supposed to be like this. One church, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're not supposed to be using our tongue in this manner. To be a part of conversations. I've had to catch myself sometimes. Topics of issue, hot topics that I wasn't either part of the problem or the solution. I want to be involved in it and get my two cents in on it. 
if my tongue is not either edifying, blessing, building someone else up, exalting God, if that my tongue is not participating in those activities, then I need to understand that it's contradicting God's word. Last thing James said in the scripture, he says, the tongue is the barometer for my spiritual condition. My tongue is my barometer for my spiritual condition. I'm going to jump ahead, but I have a scripture here that says, Matthew 12, 34, I believe, that supports this. It says, out of the abundance of the mm -mm, heart, the mouth speaks. Uh-oh. So now we found in finding out the root of what, why this tongue is so flexible. Because my tongue is releasing what my heart produced. Y'all get that? My tongue, if you want to just really know where someone is, just spend a couple days with them. Because their tongue is going to release what their heart produced. The nastiness, the ugliness, the virile things that come out of here, didn't originate it here. It originated here. So now we get into the root of this tongue issue. So let's go to verse, verse number nine. It says, with it we bless. Talking about that tongue. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who were made, paraphrasing, praising in the likeness of God. Of God. In other words, Sunday morning, I'm, God, you are so great. God, you are so good. Monday through Saturday, I'm cursing everything that he created. And we think that's okay. What the scripture is saying is that God, your people are blessing you and cursing you. Because when you curse me, I was made in the image and likeness of God. You're cursing God. We're blessing God and we're cursing God. And now we're showing what's in our heart. He's not just talking about, you know, vulgarity, spewing out things and cursing as being wrong because they use foul language. He's saying the curse is you're actually cursing me because I'm made in his likeness. And then by the time he gets to verse 11 and 12, he says, uh, verse 11 says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? If it's a fresh water spring, I can't get salt water out of it. It can't come, it can't, what's here, it's either going to be good or it's going to be evil. He says, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Pastor taught us that last week. That if I plant an apple tree, in due time, I'm only going to get apples. I can't look at that tree and be upset with it because the apple tree produced apples. I can't be upset that my apple tree did not produce oranges. Y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't get that. We're getting upset at the apple tree because it produced apples. Y'all didn't get that. We got ups I'm upset at myself because I produce vile things out of my heart. I've spoken negatively about my life and others, and now I'm expecting blessings. Everything I've spoken about me and everybody else has been negative. Now I'm getting upset that my apple tree produced apples. I, 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 I'm out. Y'all not mad at me. That's just the word. We're here frustrated because we want oranges, but we planted out. Let's, let's look at the conclusion. I'm, I'm going to wrap this up because I, I, like, I want y'all to come back next week. <laughs> Not be mad at me. This was James. This was the brother of Jesus. 
be mad at him. So what is the conclusion for all of this? Because we learn that this heart, I mean, this mouth of ours is small but yet powerful, right? We learn that it was untamable. We can't, con- we can't tame this on our own. But we learn that the mouth is great because it lets us know where we are. So what's the conclusion? How do we get better? My conclusion is that we get better when we have a, bless you, heart transplant. If my mouth is vile, that's how we can just judge ourselves that way. Don't raise your hands. If, if we have foul mouths, if our mouths don't edify, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Because we probably could all raise our hands. If my mouth is foul, if I'm not, my mouth is not being used to edify, to exalt God, then that means that there's a portion of my heart that needs to be transplanted. And so what does that mean? That means that I have to allow God to, 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 to grow me up and to be born again. I have to confront these areas of my life. Because now I realize how powerful my tongue is and how much direction it can have in my life and the life of others. So that means I have to have a transplant. And so I like this scripture. That's the reason scripture is out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. The heart is the source and the heart must be born again. This tongue is already powerful. But now my tongue needs direction. So what I have to do is let God have my heart. And pastor always talks about what is your day to death? What is the day we had our heart transplant? Can you remember the day where you said, God, this heart is yours. You, you, I, I'll give you, I'm in love with you, God. And that's how I sell the gospel. I don't sell the gospel as just something I have to do. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a response to great love that was shown to us. We're just responding to the love of Jesus. That's the good news. I don't have to manufacture anything. I'm responding to a God that loves me so much. And I'm saying, God, because you love me, I'm going to just let you control my life. And once we let him in here, then we can allow him to be released here. So that means that I've got to first and foremost give my life to God. Let him say, Jesus, I want you to be in my life. And then we, once we invite Jesus into our hearts, then the Holy Spirit, his spirit comes and he dwells within us. So now we're letting the Holy Spirit lead us. We're no longer driving. When I say driving, we're not driving the conversation. There'll be times where I want to say something so bad to some of y'all. Pastor, Pastor, because I, 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 share, I share my transgressions with some people. And Pastor knows I've been in meetings with folk, and I tell him what I wanted to say after the meeting. And I asked him, I said, can I just say what I want to say one time? Have I not told you that? It would, it would be, it would, I can be pretty, I can be pretty tough. But God said, uh, Rod, you can't say that. I did have a conversation with Priest Tato one time. I, he's laughing back there, though. He got, he got, he, he got, he, he got me in the flesh that day. And, but he, he, but I can, you know, but there's things. Every now and then, but, but I, we got to, the Holy Spirit, he's there saying, Rod, this is not about you. This is not about you. This is about my kingdom. Everyone stand. This is about my kingdom. So I just reel it, reel it, reel it in, reel it back in. Reel up, you can't, uh-uh, you, uh-uh. Dara, you, don't say that, Dara. Unsend, don't don't send that. See, we speak with our text and our emails too. Don't send that email because we want to get our peace in. God says, "Let me drive." Romans. I'm gonna read this scripture. We're closing here. 
Romans 8.29 says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. See, we always read Romans 8.28 that says, for all things work together for the good of them that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. But I like 8.29 because it says, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's where he's leading us. That's where we're headed. That's where he's trying to get us. He's just trying to get us to be like Jesus. That's it. Once we become like Jesus, then this can be tamed. Not until then, though. He gave us dominion over all this stuff except this. This can only be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for this word, God. Amen. This is God. And as a collective, this, this message was for all of us. I was saying ouch while I was preparing it. I said ouch a few times. But I think we can all do better. Because we're messengers. We're messengers of Christ. And the word we use today it's maybe not spread like wildfire, but guess what we want to do when we say things that edify God? We want to go viral. That's the new 2023 word. We want to go viral with what we say. And now to go viral, you got to say something clever. You got to, you know what I'm saying? We just want to go viral sharing his word, edifying someone. Amen. As we transition, before we bring our announcements, I want to just know this word. At the end, I talked about a relationship with Christ. Relationship with Christ is the only way that we can actually speak. We can speak life into our situations. We can speak death to our situations. And the only way we can control that, it starts with the relationship with Christ. I want everyone just to bow your heads for a moment. Because this is a precious moment. This is not a moment. We're not putting anyone on the spot, but... It, you say, I don't know Christ, but I want to know him. I, not, not just so he can control my tongue, but that so that he can just control my life. This walk with Christ has brought me so much joy. This walk with Christ has brought me so much peace. And if you're here today and say, Pastor, I just want peace. I just want the peace of God that surpasses all. I'm tired of feeling this way. I'm tired of feeling guilty. The scripture says, there is therefore now no condemnation, condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation comes from the enemy. It does not come from God. So if that's you today and say, I just want to know you, God. The fellowship of your suffering, the power of your resurrection. I'm just going to ask you to quickly just raise your hand. I want you to just keep your hands bowed, please. And I want you to just, if you say, God, I need you to work on my tongue. I've attempted to tame this tongue on my own. Heads bowed. I've attempted to control narratives and control situations on my own. And the Word says we can't do it on our own. We've got to give that to God. If that's you now that needs prayer, for a tame tongue. I want you to raise your hand. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a sovereign God. That simply means that you are in control, God. And so God, we acknowledge that we don't have control and we especially acknowledge that we don't have control over our tongue. God, help us to speak your word. You've given us this wonderful opportunities to be teachers. And that's just not in the pulpit, God. But you've assigned us to be teachers in the classrooms. You've assigned us to be teachers in the workplace. You've assigned us to be teachers wherever we go, whether we're driving Uber, whether we're whatever we're doing, whether we're coaching football, basketball, or baseball, or meeting someone at the at the gas station, you've assigned us to be teachers of your gospel. So, God, we want to take this 
uh, with responsibility that you've assigned us to, God. And we ask right now that you take over our hearts. We ask that you make us clean. Psalms 51 says that I'll renew in me a clean heart. Clean our hearts, God. Clean our hearts. Wash us so that we'll be whiter than snow, God. If you keep continue to read in Psalms 51, it says, once I'm clean, once I'm washed, then I can teach transgressors. Once I'm cleaned up, then I can speak your word the way that you desire that I speak it, God. But for now, clean us all up, God. Make us new. We accept you and the work you want to do. We just submit ourselves to your work, your will, and your way. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Have a seat real quick. we got some announcements. Welcome to One Church ATL. We are happy that you chose to worship with us this morning. Please listen closely to today's announcements. One Finance is a financial foundation session to help you get on and stay on your financial track to reach all goals you have set. Join us every first Tuesday at 6 p.m. A family that prays together stays together. Join us every second and fourth Wednesday at 6 p.m. for our corporate prayer session, then every first Sunday for family prayer. Join us every Saturday at 1 p.m. for food distribution with our community. We will be serving food until food supplies last. October 14th is a night of hope presented by the One Heart Women's Ministry. There will be a live all-female band, boutique shopping experience, gourmet refreshments, and our keynote speaker, Kia Stevens. This is a free event, but please scan the QR code to secure your spot by October 7th. a One Church ATL moment by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and now TikTok at One Church ATL. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you next week. And I just want to, uh, I want to first of all just stop and just acknowledge all of our uh, missionaries that showed up yesterday for our food distribution. Do we have our picture? Just look at this, man. We had almost 30 people that showed up. We had a great time. And it was so awesome because what's so fun about having more people is you just get to do the job with more excellence. We did a great job of serving Cobb County. We met some great people. We prayed with some people. And that's what it's all about. But I want to just say thank you to you all that actually uh, joined us yesterday. And I want to just read... Uh, emphasize our women's event that we're having next Saturday. If you haven't signed up, I heard that we have 55 women that have signed up for this event. Amen. It's a free event. So if you haven't signed up, please do so. We got a dynamic speaker. These women, they have been putting together some strong uh, 
curriculums for our women. So please make sure you're there. We're going to have a great time. And also, the other announcement, um, let's make sure this is our month where we're going to be uh, inviting someone to church. So let's make sure, can, can we just commit to this week inviting one family to just come and fellowship with us? If, think about if all of us invited one family. You love your, do you all love your church? You all, do you all love your church? So if you love your church, I see you invited someone. Thank you. Oh, that's right. He just got back from his honeymoon, too. He's glowing. You got a new little glow on your face. Congratulations there. Been just loving on each other, and he invited a friend, and that's what it's all about. If we love our church, we believe we're doing great things within ourselves and in the community. Let's invite someone. I'm going to make sure that next week I have someone here uh, uh, to, be, to come and hang out with us. And I'm trying to make sure I didn't leave anything. Oh, I see we got one of our college students in town. Stand up back there, uh, Mr. Brian Graham. I call him Crusher. He's away. Tennessee. Where are you? Where are you? Where's he in school? North Carolina. I'm sorry. He's in North Carolina playing football. Shoulders getting broader. Voice got deeper. And you know, we just we thank God. We we they've been with us since we started from the very day. They've been with us, that family. We love that family. If you just walk by him and on his way back to school, just, you know, shake his hand. And it's okay to, you know, give, you know how grandma used to shake your hand and be a little something in it? Put something in that young man's hand, man, on his way back to school. Yes, sir. We got, oh, the golf tournament. Okay. Okay. So we go, so let's first remember next Monday is our golf tournament. Thank you for some of you that have already begun to sign up. We got a lot of great sponsors, a lot of people in the community. I'll have the, or we'll have the chief of police there um, that'll open up, and we've got some city government officials that are going to be there to let the people know that our city and our civic community is behind us. So let's make sure that we have representation there. We do things uh, of excellence, and this is not going to be any different. And then the men's event, I'm assuming that you guys, I don't want to get, because I don't know the details, I would just maybe expect you guys to maybe get some of the announcements for next week so you guys can see it uh, on the screen. Let's stand up and, do we have any visitors? You Thank you, sir, for visiting with us. We uh, praise God. I um, can warn you that before you can get out of here, these people are going to love on you. So don't be alarmed by that. Okay, he said that's why he's here, one church. He's here for the love. So let's make sure that we show my brother the love. God bless you, man. Um, just stand up. Let's get ready to go. But I want to just thank you for those that give in our offering. and We'll put our uh, ways to give on the screen. Let's always remember that we, we do have work. Pastor and I don't spend as much time just beating you guys up over the offering. I've seen churches do that, and that's just not our style. But you guys are responsible, right? We don't pass it around. We, I've seen preachers preach a, a pre-sermon just to take the offering. We're not going to do that. We'll teach on it from time to time so we understand that we give as a response to his goodness to us, but we don't give out of duress. And so, but we want to say thank you to you all that give here because we're able to do the work of the Lord. We're able to you know, be a blessing to others. We're able to just do ministry, you know, the way that the Bible has commanded us to. But I want to say thank you and make sure that for you all that are here that, we, you know, you understand how to pay tithes and offering uh, through the church. And so, um, and next, ne in a couple of weeks after the golf tournament, as a matter of fact, the next time I'm up here before you teaching, I'm going to just report to you on where we are with our golf tournament and, and where we are with our capital campaign so that we can understand, we talked about investments today, how we can be a part of, uh, of, of investing in what God, uh, the instruction that God has given us to, to build him a temple, amen? Amen. Any other announcements? Have I covered everything? Did I tell you you look good, babe? That's my, that's my, uh, was, there was someone on uh, Facebook or Instagram, they were talking about how to preach, you know how to preach when they get up and they talk about their wives? And they're like, that's my rib, baby, you my rib, you my... Well, that's, that, you know, that, that's how I feel about my wife. My wife is, she, you are my everything. I want to say that publicly. 
fun in this church that I love you and I thank God for you. Amen. Let's go home, guys. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, God. We love you. We celebrate you. We thank you for your word here today that has changed all of our lives, God. We can never be the same because your word has made us free. You said whom the Son set free is free indeed. So, God, we thank you that you loved us. And in return, we love you back. We kiss back to you, God. We worship you, God. We love you, God, and we praise you. Because we love you, this week we're going to use these tongues to share the good news with someone, God. We celebrate you, God. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hug on someone. Hug on someone. Love on someone.